back, folks. I can't believe it is already time for our last official panel of the day, other than our closing thoughts with our executive director. But I can't think of anyone better for us to close out this conference with than Ben Bartlett, Berkeley City Council member, startup lawyer, my fellow member of the California Blockchain Working Group, and a dear friend. So I'm so thrilled to be uh, hosting this fireside chat with you. Ben, I thought we would start by talking a bit about government applications, and we could talk about what we saw as members of the Blockchain Working Group. The official title of our fireside chat is, Where Do We Go From Here? And so I do want to have a future focus um, on what members of the audience could do in order to facilitate the creation of blockchain law for social good. Um, but first, I thought I might let you introduce yourself. We've been doing very formal introductions, but I thought I might let you introduce yourself and um, talk a bit about the work that you do. Well, thank you, Michelle, and uh, thank you all for coming. It's um, wonderful to be here. You know, it's the, I'm the last one, so I <laughs> got to save the best for last. Is that exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, <laughs> We'll see. I want to say, Michelle, I'm so proud of you, by the way. I feel like I was, I've, I've seen you every step of the way in developing this process and launching this, this new initiative, and it's amazing to see it all come together. Very proud thank of you. you. You're an inspiration. Uh, well, thank you. <laughs> and, and if you now you're going to make me blush. See? And I tell you, if you had been my professor when I was in law school, I'd be an actual lawyer instead of a politician. <laughs> Uh, playing a lawyer, <laughs> but yeah. You know, so yes, I, I I am on the Berkeley City Council. Um, it's my second term now, six years in the game. Um, and when I got elected, I had come from a background um, of of innovation and technology. Um, I helped develop products, technology products, and I was focused heavily in environmental finance. So EV infrastructure, these um, new finance packages using tax equity to drive adoption of renewable energy products. And so when I took office, um, th we, we had just attempted in my job to create a solar coin. Uh, this would be a coin to help low-income people um, participate and develop EV infrastructure and charging and portable electrons uh, way, ahead of it, way ahead of the time. It, ca it can't even happen now, let alone eight years ago. But it was fresh in the, on my mind back then, I could not accomplish it because we didn't know anyone, didn't have the know-how. So then in council, uh, a year or so later, we had an explosion of homelessness and we had two deaths of exposure uh, on the street. And at the same time, the corporate tax rates were being cut dramatically, uh, so much so that it implicated our ability to develop affordable housing and senior housing. So we decided to crowdfund them. And by crowdfund, I mean um, using blockchain. <laughs> so we created a new mechanism to issue ultra low cost bonds to people, called them micro bonds, using technology, the blockchain technology. And the goal was to solve for two things at the same time. One, to meet acute infrastructure deficit needs, and two, to solve for poverty by allowing ordinary folks to buy these municipal assets, which typically cost half a million dollars at the at minimum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was a democratizing money. And this was a pilot project that you created um, and implemented. And I do know that there are, are other jurisdictions sort of watching to see how this happens. Last we talked, you had um, just chosen a partner for the micro bond. Um, and do you have any more details, as in including how much the bond might be? Yes. So this pilot, and by the way, we passed this in 2017. Mm -hmm. So five years later, we are ready to go. We have the vendor chosen. Uh, they're a group called Valdez and Moreno, Moreno and they're a, a municipal bond advisory shop. And one of their partners did a mini bond offering in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So the city felt comfortable with their ability to be compliant and do smaller denominations, even though that was much larger than our denominations. We're talking $5 here, we want to do. Oh, wow. And ours is actually blockchain and smart contracts, so the proceeds can be programmable and have community benefit. and derive other sources of value besides just the pecuniary return. Um, so, yeah, we chose someone, and they've had a kickoff meeting. They're planning. It's going to come out in the next few months. I'm so excited. And I can tell you this. Um, when we published it five, six years ago, that act alone generated so much ac action and buzz around the world that governments called my office from Japan to Houston. And we fielded so many calls because they, they all have the same need. Decrepit infrastructure and scalar poverty. Mm. 
So if you have two negatives that you can maybe sync together by crowdfunding into the community to fix the problems and generate returns for them, you have a future economy. And so I do believe uh, that what we've created in Berkeley will be a game changer for the global economy. And I think that if we don't find a way to expand the economic pie, uh, we're going to topple over. And you see evidence that's all over the world right now. Mm -hmm. The wealth constriction is so severe that every country is on the verge of toppling right now. So we've got to spread the money around. And this is one way. I think that's right. We talk a lot about financial inclusion when we're discussing social good. And one question I often get is, can you give me concrete examples of blockchain being used for social good? And I always pivot to Berkeley. Um, not surprising that Berkeley's on the cutting edge of all this stuff, but it is a really exciting case study for folks to watch um, and really demonstrating the power of this technology. So I think that's a really fun thing. And what were some challenges that you faced in trying? Because I know there are probably going to be folks either online or in the room who would like to bring this idea back to their jurisdictions. What are some of the challenges you faced? So the first challenge was um, education. Um, you know, the, the city was afraid of it. Uh, no one understood it. They thought we were doing Bitcoin, thought we were bringing the dark web into our into our community, <laughs> when audit is really it really is just a, a digital offering, and the technology allows for it to be issued much more cheaply and to be automated and directed to do certain things, and that's all it is, mm -hmm. and you know it allows for transparency, so you can view where it's going and you can destroy it and reissue it if it gets stolen or hacked quite easily, uh, and, it, and it and it allows for targeted targeted directed microfinance. So you could do one community theater. You could do one park. You could do one affordable housing project. Or you could do a networked series of micro hospitals across 25 counties. You can do anything with it, right? So um, the education was key, but we, we did educate and was passed unanimously a couple of times. Um, and the city got on board as well. Our bond council bought into it after many, many, many conversations over many years. <laughs> they did. Uh, and then, yeah, that's, that's the key thing, education. And also, they, they wonder if it's going to be legal. It's totally legal. It's just a muni bond. Mm -hmm. And it's under a lot less scrutiny than other financial instruments because the federal government's policy is that municipal bonds should be highly fungible. So they want everyone to be able to get one. Mm -hmm. And I know you had talked about limiting this to Berkeley residents to start. Is that still the plan? Yeah, so, you know, I can't speak for the, for the vendor. Mm -hmm. They're going to have their own plan. They're going to market it. They're going to do it. They're going to choose a technology provider and et cetera. Uh, but I do believe the plan is intended to be um, a 3 to $5 million offering around something engaging like a microgrid, or affordable housing, or a public theater, something fun um, that we can point to, mm -hmm. and to issue it first to Berkeley residents, and then to open it up to the world at large. Because you want to get the first dibs to the community, but That's great. we want that torrent of, um, of liquidity as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling it will be oversubscribed based on what I've seen and the buzz that I've seen around it. Um, great, and so in addition to being a Berkeley City Council member and pushing municipal innovation forward, you are also a startup lawyer. You wear a lot of hats. Um, so I thought it would be fun to ask you, what are you seeing in your work? When, when Ben comes to my blockchain law class, and those of you who have been in that class know, he's one of uh, an incredibly engaging guest lecturer when he comes to my class. Um, and so I'm curious what you're seeing on the ground. Well, thank you. And your students are amazing, too. Our, your students are doing really well after your class, and your classes are great to talk to. Um, so yeah, so I, 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 I always hone in on cutting edge thought. It's just, I get bored otherwise, you know. <laughs> I grew up in science fiction. My favorite movie was Dune, the original Dune, the only Dune. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I'm serious, that's the only Dune. Yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I've always sought this stuff out, right? I'm still looking for UFOs. I, wa I look at the skies every day when I'm walking. I'm looking for that cigar ship UFO. I'm gonna see one one day. Uh, so in the meantime, I seek out people to help with my legal skills and business skills to help them grow their ideas. And what I'm seeing in, in this sector, because I'm focused now mainly on Web3 since we created this business, um, I'm seeing um, 
people seeking out a way to operate you know, with, the, with the oncoming um, governmental activities, right? Mm -hmm. So ever since Terra Luna collapsed there, as we talked about <laughs> ad nauseum the last two days, right? Uh, the government's coming. So they're going to regulate this stuff. So that they're seeking ways to, to withstand it, to get compliant. They're setting up businesses in Wyoming. Um, they're forming, you know, uh, corporate entities like that. They are, um, they're doing new forms of token launches that are not ICOs. Uh, a lot of activity in the Cayman Islands and BVI. Of course, you heard that too. Mm -hmm. um, I'm seeing metaverse activity uh, with people designing uh, novel forms of economic commerce in, in, in proposed metaverses. Uh, I'm seeing a lot, not so much gameplay anymore. I'm seeing a lot of music. Hmm. A lot of people doing music platforms, uh, incorporating the technology and the tokenomics. Um, I'm seeing a lot of social tokens where people are doing micro scholarships, investing in people. Like, you know, you're like one of your law students, right? Uh, this, young, this young woman right here, uh, she says 2L, she's got straight A's. I'm willing to finance her third year and her bar um, in exchange for 10% of her income for seven years. And they're crowdfunding that. And that social token is your token. So I'm seeing a lot of that happen. Interesting. I have three different groups doing that. Um, <laughs> yeah. so, uh, so I'm sorry, I have to stop with this. Uh, people funding scholarships for law students has perked my ears up a little. Um, and so when, when folks are doing this then, are they, it's, it's all contractually based, I would imagine. Um, and then the first thing that comes to mind would be, well, is that indentured servitude, <laughs> right? If you're offering, but, but what I suspect is happening is that you're gonna have to draft contracts that would also include what happens if they're not employed, right? Yeah, I mean, there's no guarantee. It's, right. It's a speculative right. instrument on behalf yeah. of the, the, the lender or investor. But it's investing in someone's career as opposed to investing in a particular company, which is a really unique an exciting take on it. That's so interesting. Yeah, and it somehow merges a bit of the social good because they're picking kids from low-income areas mm -hmm. and supporting them, getting them up into college and helping them go to better school than they would go normally. That's so So giving them money to travel, money for clothes, like the way they treat athletes. Mm. But these aren't athletes. These are just kids who study hard and deserve a shot. Well, I love the idea of taking some of that athletic funding and moving it over to the academic side. So I fully support <laughs> anything that would that would fund academics. That's wonderful. Um, and so what are the legal issues then that would come up? Are, are people using smart contracts to do that? The, the legal issues, by and large, are securities issues. Ah, uh, yeah. Because everything, everything everyone's doing is a violation of some securities law. <laughs> 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 and so everybody, everybody wants to open things up for ordinary people. But it's very hard because, as we talked about ad nauseum again these last couple of days, the laws are set up um, to protect people. Mm -hmm. And by protect, that means cordon them off from opportunity. Too often, right? So that's the problem. They're always having to create carve-outs or do exceptions or limit their offerings to accredited investors or to small numbers of people. And so it's it's really problematic. It's it's an issue um, that we got to we have to fix. Yeah, I mean the thing with accredited investors too. When I when I'm teaching business associations and students ask me, well, who's an accredited investor? And it's someone who either makes enough of income or has enough of assets to be able to engage in risky investments, on the presumption that because you're wealthy, you're sophisticated. And that's my problem with accredited investor rules is that because you inherited money doesn't mean that you're sophisticated. But you could be a very sophisticated investor who didn't inherit money, right? And so there certainly is room for public protection. We need to find a way to protect unsophisticated investors. But the sort of line in the sand, you have money, therefore you're allowed to do this, um, really does exclude a lot of folks. <clears throat> You're exactly right, and so what, you know, one idea that's been coming up in some of my conversations, and I do I do consult uh, with regulators around the country, uh, and I speak a lot with groups. Uh, and one idea that keeps coming up, which is interesting, uh, is one of insurance. Hmm. So a private insurance pool funded by the industry to cover losses, and so that can be in fraud, or it could be that mainly fraud, right, or extreme loss. And that's got, it's an interesting idea because that insurance pool has its corollary in the traditional finance world. Um, and it could be regulated and it could be used to really buffer 
the risk profile of a non-accredited investor so that we could possibly uh, get people to stop leaving America to set up their crypto companies and come here and grow. That's something we talked about a lot this morning um, with our California policymakers and our workshop was people are leaving California. Um, what can we do? And I think that, as you and I know from working on the working group together, the blockchain working group, California is like, a, is like the Titanic, right? Hopefully not with the same result, right? But like moving us is a really big deal as opposed to a small, less populated state like Wyoming, which is so nimble and can make these really risky laws and see how they pan out. Um, when we do it, we have to do it right in California, right? That we have so many millions of stakeholders who would be affected if we did it wrong. And so I do think that that balance between public protection while still trying to promote innovation is something that probably every jurisdiction is struggling with, but we know that California is struggling with. You're exactly right. I mean, we're the home of both. We're the home of technology, the home of the rich people, and all the poor people too. Mm. <laughs> so they're all here <laughs> in the fourth largest economy in the world, and we've got to get it right. And you know, to, to their credit, the California um, government is very forward thinking, and they have a lot of smart people. And you know, they created the blockchain working group that you and I served on, and they've been slowly implementing some of our recommendations, mm -hmm. such as vital records being stored in the blockchain. Uh, hopefully, they'll implement Calcha uh, CalCoin. CalCoin. Yes, I love CalCoin. If you're listening, CalCoin, CalCoin. Ben and I have been pushing CalCoin for a while. Yes. Years now, actually. Pre-pandemic, we were talking about CalCoin. Yeah. Yes, yeah. before there were masks. <laughs> the the, <laughs> the CalCoin, of course, would be a state benefits coin that you could be a portal to millions of people to distribute benefits more rapidly without the fraud, two-way communication. It could be used for anything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's another thing, too, another trend is the utility NFTs. Yeah. So NFTs were great, you know, collector's items, little trinkets, but now their true potential is being explored now by many people. And that they're portable data packets, yeah. portable instructions. So they're really smart tokens at this point. So you, have, you can have an NFT what, what, that's a pre-sale. I, I have one group I'm advising. They're doing, they're doing pipeline development and finance using NFTs. Hmm. So your NFT is your section of pipeline that you financed. It has your insurance information there, the, the, the development process, the, the, all, the, all the paperwork you would have normally, and also your metric rate of flow and return on a minute-by-minute minute basis. For the literal pipeline. The literal eight feet of pipeline that you just financed. That's so interesting. Yeah. Um, and it's so it, it, you can sell it, trade it, whatever. It's, it's portable, provided the person's a credit investor. I was going to say, there's some <laughs> Howie issues perhaps with that, but we won't go too far down that road. <laughs> Um, and so, so I'd like to turn the conversation to DAOs for a bit because you have really been on the cutting edge of DAOs uh, over the last few years. And so I thought it would be fun to ask you a bit about what you're seeing and what, what do you think the future of DAOs would be? So DAOs a big one as well. The, that's the new corporate form. That is the new emergent corporate form. LLC, before LLCs were invented by Wyoming, by the way, uh, the C Corp was the dominant business form and then LLCs came and now they dwarf it. And emergent form, form, the emergent form is the DAO, uh, the Decentralized Autonomous Organization, and it is, it is coming on strong. So Wyoming has legislation, I think Kentucky just did something, um, and more are on the way. Mm -hmm. So this allows these crypto companies to, to these, 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 these congresses of decision makers to have an entity for protection. Obviously, so the issue with DAOs, though, is they have massive treasuries, and if they're not in form, if they don't have a corporate form, they're all liable to each other and to the world at large. Uh, it's, it's not a not partnership, a yeah, right? as a partnership, it's a partnership mm -hmm. which is unlimited joint liability, right? Scary. Right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not really an incentive to do business. <laughs> so uh, you know, there there is a trend now to get them compliant mm -hmm. by regulators too, right? To get them compliant to get their treasuries in the banking system so the money becomes stabilized. When Terra Luna went down, which was a DAO itself, with a massive treasury, mm -hmm. if that treasury had been banked and stabilized, it would have withstood the rigor of its attack by Wall Street that killed it. If it had been banked in a traditional banking institution, do you mean? Yes, okay. or even a novel one. Uh -huh. Just some, some degree of its treasury converted to something stable 
uh-huh. and held and you know held, and then leveraged to borrow against it for stability, for rapid loans, commercial mm-hmm. paper, as mm-hmm. they do in the TradFi world. If they had that corollary, they would be around today. So a lot of regulators are asking these DAOs to, to come up with ways to get compliant and to stabilize their treasuries because lots of people lost a lot of money. Yeah. Two trillion dollars of the crypto economy were wiped out when Trilona collapsed. And, and we know um, the word that was used today was that it was an activating event for policymakers and government regulators, is that right? The term? That was the term that was used this morning. It was an activating event, meaning that's when people started to pay attention. And the problem, of course, is that if people are starting to pay attention because $2 trillion has been wiped out, that's how the regulations and laws are going to be written. Exactly. At that level, you're talking pension funds lost money. Yeah, yeah. Which is not good. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, it, so, so the, the, the context of the future is traditional finance, i.e. Wall Street, is coming in. Mm-hmm. Their, their investment numbers are through the roof right now. They're investing in the space. They're gobbling up. They're creating new forms. Regulators are coming in mm-hmm. to do their to do their very best to merge it with traditional finance and let them be captured. And then you have um, in the middle the the the, innovat- the innovators, the rebels, pushing forward into new territory. So I think the future is going to be that middle ground where there's some some guidelines, but still some freedom. And so. You know, I think that I think the smart players are going to have ideas that can help guide them into a compliant realm where they can still operate without being bought by one of the big banks. Mm, I see. Yeah, that because I think that essentially what you're talking about, Ben, is a combination of traditional finance and decentralized finance, DeFi and TradFi, exactly working together. Yes. Um, I can see arguments from both sides about why they wouldn't want to do that, <laughs> right? I mean, TradFi is going to say we don't trust DeFi, and DeFi is going to say we don't trust TradFi. Um, but how do you think they could work together in order to make that happen? Well, the bridges. Well, TradFi wants people, right? They want accounts. They want money inside their banks. Mm-hmm. And DeFi has lots of people. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that that's the move. Okay. It's, it's already happening. You know, behind the scenes, some of the centralized C corps that do the development work for some of the protocols are heavily invested into sometimes majority stakes by some of the larger banks. So it's already happening. <laughs> but you, you have to remember too, though, and this is to get r- something to get right as a policymaker, as an attorney, um, anyone else, is that this industry was born of rebellion. Mm-hmm. This is the non surreal industry. When the 2008 crash happened, the Bitcoin white paper came out Mm -hmm. and it said very explicitly, this is a a reaction to to your corrupt money system destroying people. We're making our own. So that's never gonna go away. And the technology is so nimble that any young person with a computer can launch a new product at any time. So you have to understand that. (laughs) And and that's something that will, will never go away. Mm-hmm. And so working with reality um, on, on, on the front side, on the, on the two sides, the government, TradFi, and then the rebellion, youthful side, right? Understand that they're, they're, both trends are colliding and operating as a sort of yin-yang whole. Mm. If you can capture that, you'll create the most value. That is fascinating. I mean, it does remind me, Professor Tanya Evans said in her keynote yesterday, she showed us a headline that said, Wall Street banks are quietly moving into crypto. And our question was, why is it quiet? Why are they quietly moving in? And I think you've just explained it, right? That the rebellion piece frightens those who have already succeeded and for whom the traditional financial system is working. Um, but there is, there, there's no way that the attraction of DeFi is not gonna actually bring traditional financial actors to the table. Yeah, precisely. And it's, I, I think policymakers ha- have to be in the middle of that because, you know, the, the, we're we're in danger of the the Web three economy replicating the previous economy, which is extremely unfair and led to the world we live in now. Mm-hmm. We don't want to recreate that. We want to use technology to improve it. Remember, technology is like a spear; it extends the human's reach. So we have to actually use it to actually extend our reach and create a better world. Um, otherwise, we're wasting our time. 
And I believe in the potential of it. That's why I've embraced it. That's why I drink the Kool-Aid. Because I see within that rebellious spirit um, a spark of hope for mankind. Yeah, and I will say I think that policymakers are making, or they're, they are becoming educated about it. One of the things we discussed in the working group was voting and whether we should have blockchain voting in California. Um, and we did the research and went out and talked to computer scientists about it. And it turns out there's a lot of points of failure that have nothing to do with blockchain, but have everything to do with downloading malware onto your phone that could actually change your vote as it's tra being transmitted through a centralized server at the county elections office, right? And so there are so many, and so that's why the working group said no, we're not gonna do any voting um, on the blockchain. Now there are of course some companies and, and jurisdictions that are trying to do that and it'll be interesting to see what happens with that. That's the one I worry there's gonna be a high stakes failure with voting and that will be a drag on the industry. So let's hope that doesn't happen. That's my fear um, related to voting. But these, these unusual use cases, um, firearm registration, right? Uh, putting state archives on a blockchain. There's so much excitement that we could do around the non-sexy use cases um, that I think most, and that's what we're trying to do with the center, of course, is to educate people around that. Um, so I just wanted to ask another question around financial inclusion. We've talked about DAOs, we've talked about NFTs, we've talked about government applications. Um, let's talk about payments and benefits. So we also discussed in the working group the idea of being able to use blockchain technology to streamline payments like welfare payments or government benefits programs um, and decided that it was too risky. And I thought um, you might, I don't know if you remember that conversation, I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, but I thought that might be an interesting thing for folks to hear about. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so the, the risk factors were high, but I, I just want to jump back to, oh, the, voting, yes. to the voting, to the voting piece. Mm -hmm. So people always call me, they go, hey, I have, a, I have a startup, we can do voting. And I know it sounds great, it sounds easy, it sounds so smooth, right? Just vote in your phone, you're good to go. But we looked into it and it really is a mess. <laughs> if you yes. hear about it, don't do it. Write your congressperson and say, don't do it. Yes. There's so many points of failure. And we did this before the Trump election, yes. right? Okay. Where they're out there raising holy heck about it. And trust me, just don't do it. Don't yeah. do it. Yeah, it's too dangerous now. <laughs> it is dangerous, even for a small state. I mean, there was talk about, well, maybe just for like a BART board election or yeah. something that's a smaller stakes election than a presidential election. But there is no such thing as an election we think should be corrupted, right? And yeah. so that, there's not a very good pilot election for us with that, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So the benefits come is interesting. Um, the the benefit the, the good parts were that it would it would have reduced fraud. We hoped mm -hmm. because fraud was tremendous, especially with the pandemic relief checks that went out. We know about that. Yeah. Uh, and the ongoing benefits around housing and healthcare, et cetera. Uh, but the bad part, what, the, what was the bad part actually? I don't With remember. benefits, the, when I, ta I actually called the Social Security office and talked to them about it, um, and they were saying that these are people's entire livelihoods. And so we're not going to hand it over to a technology that we feel is not yet trustable, right? So then the question was, well, do we run a parallel? Um, kind of like the proof of stake work that ETH is, that Ethereum did, right? Where they ran a parallel proof of stake system to the proof of work system just to make sure it worked before they actually, so that was another discussion was, and you might not have been in this conversation actually now that I think about it, um, because I was talking to the Secretary of State's office about it, and the problem is, the question, I said, why don't we run a parallel blockchain application to see whether or not it would streamline benefits, and the response was, but, but there's no reason to do that because we have this system, right? <laughs> and it makes sense, it's an under-resourced agency why would they invest the funds in doing that? And so I think that's another real hindrance to development of social good use cases is just resources. Yes, and capture. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Definitely. So, you know, these are 10 year contracts held by vendors mm -hmm. that make a lot of money from the government, inefficiencies produce lots of jobs, inefficiencies produce um, complex management protocols that are hard to just hand to someone else. Mm. So you have to be there to do it. Uh, there's a lot of reasons uh, why they would not try a new system. Mm -hmm. uh, it's extraordinarily difficult. Um, I grew up, uh, my mother is an educator and she has a reading system that she sells to school districts and I've watched her for 35 years 
hit the same issue over and over and over, uh, trying to supplant a failing system because all the vested interests involved in it. Interesting. So there's that. Yeah. Right? yeah. The business of government is business, right? Mm -hmm. It's a big business. And it's a huge driver of value and employment and contracts. So yeah, it's a, it's a battle. Yeah, it's a yes, battle. and it might yeah. be, it's a better, that's a municipal issue maybe to start with, or maybe a yeah. state like Wyoming that can be more nimble could do something like that and, and have, then we have a proof of concept yeah. you know, that yeah. could work. Yeah, definitely. Um, great, and then um, can you tell us a little bit about what you think government policymakers are gonna be, now it's a little unfair to ask this question, uh, with the midterms coming up, um, but we have had seen a lot of really interesting blockchain and crypto legislation, and I'm kind of curious about your take on the federal legislation, how it might even preempt state legislation, as we're seeing with the privacy issues right now, and and this the you know all the the uh, federal privacy legislation, the ADPPA that's been debated. Um, and I'm sort of curious, right now we have a patchwork legislative effort across the states, and I'm curious if you think it's going to stay that way. Well, so just last year I, I took the reins of a super PAC <laughs> for a while, and I, I, ran, some, I ran some campaigns um, to, to promote candidates around the country who are crypto friendly. And what I heard from them is what I heard everywhere else, and these are different jurisdictions, um, is that they are locally, they want to encourage it. There's much more interest in local governments and states to develop their, their crypto industries. And on the federal level, um, there's a big schism. Uh, a part of it wants to snuff it out, mm -hmm. and the other wants to, I guess, kind of let it roll, libertarian style. Mm. Um, and so that conflict um, kind of runs, it's Republican-Democrat at this point, right, unfortunately, as a, as a Democrat, it's disappointing. It is, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and the partisanship has gotten into crypto is tough. Yeah, yeah. it shouldn't be that way. Um, and so I think, and th but there's an X factor. The X factor is the CBDC, the Central Bank Digital Currency. Mm. Now, th uh, that's more than just a nifty way to have a more seamless um, national currency. It's becoming now of geostrategic, it's becoming now uh, important in the, in the geographical strategic sense mm. because Russia and China and other countries are coming together to create their own asset-backed digital instrument mm -hmm. which will directly confront the US dollar and directly affect American hegemony. So we now have to figure something out rapidly and deploy it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so it, it's hard to say how, what that looks like because I think I my, I think they're going to um, do the, the 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 token taxonomy, where they're going to declare utility and security, et cetera, mm -hmm. and let the SEC and the um, the commodity future exchange cover the, each one um, under their purview, while having total control of stable coins. Um, and the C, uh, under the CBDC umbrella. And they'll be used for trade instruments, they'll be used for um, all the things that the, the more sophisticated dollar instruments are used for. And that's strictly to confront the China-Russia competing utilities, um, commodities back coin, which is coming like in 2023. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you're thinking Treasury then would likely be Yes. The regulator for the treasury will be involved deeply. Yeah, um, yeah, and so this is this is no joke, right? The 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 Ukrainian war has knocked off mm -hmm. food production and also fertilizer production, so there's a bit of a stranglehold right now on that stuff, and so they're going to be in a power position in 2023. So in DC, I'm I'm hearing about from from people in DC that they're actively working to confront that via w one of these instruments. I think it's notable too that in the uh, Loomis Gillibrand bill uh, that was just, it was just announced and proposed uh, in the summer and has kind of been kicked to later in the legislative cycle, but there's a whole section of that bill based on China, which seems sort of surprising. They, they would have a section on China in a bill around crypto in the US until you remember that you're exactly right, there's a challenge coming from China related to the dollar, yeah. So it's a high stakes game. I and mean, who knew that this, uh, this, you know, this is really a kid's toy, 
right? It's a fun thing to do. That's why they can never, they'll never be able to kill it either because it's fun. Mm-hmm. It's <laughs> super fun and interesting and weird and, and cute, you know, and everyone loves it. And you can, we're all going to have our own coins. Mm. Every family will have its own family coin. And you can do things with it and give it to the people. And, you know, I could, I could have bought my ticket to your event with my family coin because it can convert on some automated rail into your currency. All that's coming. We did talk about having an NFT ticket, actually. One of my students last semester wrote a paper on NFTs, and Basilio Mendez, who I see up there, who is our associate director, and actually designed the website and came up with the purple color. So thank you, Basilio, for that. Um, we kind of kicked around uh, the idea, but it, we're, we were so new. We didn't want, I don't want any problem. I, I have the voting thing in my mind. I don't want any malware going anywhere toward my conference tickets. <laughs> Um, and so the national security interest in this, I think you're absolutely right, where f we see on the one hand something like tornado cash, which we were just talking about with Marta Belcher in our last fireside chat, um, and the fears around the national security implications of decentralized money. Uh, and now we're, and then on the flip side, we see the way that governments are going to be using CDBCs, which really, in truth, are not not really decentralized, right, um, in the same way that Bitcoin is. Right. Well, they're programmable. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing. Yeah. You can tell the coin where it can go. So it's, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. It's, uh, yeah. It can be very empowering if programmed to go the right direction, mm -hmm. like into under-resourced communities and nations, or it can be a weapon and used to maintain power. So this is why... Um, whatever we're discussing here, at the root of it, we have to get right our ethical democracy. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. from that will flow the best use of this technology and all technologies. So here's a question that's sort of Orwellian in nature. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so could it be that with the CBDC, will there be the technical possibility that a government would be able to redirect it based on the whims of an administration? Absolutely. We do that now with the World sure. Bank, the IMF, and the Fed. Mm -hmm. The Fed, of course. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't know what kind of governance mechanism we could possibly have. Yeah. Um, who knows, right? Yeah. yeah. Instant settlement is great, unless it's not, right? Unless there's surveillance attached, right? <laughs> and there will be. Yeah. Right, but but I think the idea is that the American dollar coin would be freer than its Chinese counterpart, which True. is not free. And would hopefully have less surveillance and more privacy. Yes. Well, that sounds optimistic to say, yes. but much more than in a country that's not a democracy. Right. And I think, I think they, they have to have the, the, the greater freedom in it mm -hmm. in order to compete mm -hmm. with, with the totalitarian counterpart. Right. So if you're in the, in the world, in the money market world, and you have a choice between a free moving dollar and a tracked um, Yuan, mm -hmm, I guess, mm -hmm. you want to choose the dollar if you're, like, I guess, I hope, right? I don't even I know anymore. So. I don't even know anymore what's going on. <laughs> well, we've been, <laughs> these are some heavy issues that we're talking about here related to social good and the future of this technology. Yes. Um, I did want to make sure that I know that there's folks in the room who are very excited uh, that you're here, and I did want to offer the opportunity for people to ask questions. Um, and I think, Mike, you're up to be our microphone runner. You've got it, great. Okay, um, now we can't see you at all with the lights. <laughs> it's kind of like Broadway, really. We're like, you don't even know the audience is there. <laughs> I, am I holding the mic too close to my face? I feel, because you're like way down here. I'm so loud, Ben. I talk okay. so, I have, I have a projected voice from teaching so long. And actually, I will tell you that my kids tease me when I go home because they say, you're in your teaching voice. How was your day? What's for dinner? <laughs> so that's why I hold it far away. I'll, I'll try that. <laughs> hey, this is Carla. Um, I'm just so impressed that you are, are able to move that municipal bond. And I wondered, like, how did you, or did you work with state regulators on that? How, like, what was the interaction there? I, I'm just baffled that it's going through, and I'm just thrilled. You know, actually, that one, um, I didn't talk, talk to the state at all. It was purely... I talked to the industry. Uh, I went and I went and met all the, the the creators of these coins and these platforms and these products. Many of them lived in Berkeley, um, and then we talked to a couple of experts in bond issuances and got the the legal outlay. 
Uh, and then, then it was all creative, designing it so it's attractive, so it's a good systems approach uh, of, of, of a circular economy and generating value round and round and round. And once we thought that model through and had it locked down, uh, it became a matter of persuading the council and the community. And it was an effort. But back then, uh, this is before um, Coinbase IPO. So the community here in the Bay Area, of the crypto community, was very engaged, um, very hungry, and they, they helped. They showed up at council. Imagine these young, <laughs> these young DGENs come to <laughs> a Berkeley City Council meeting. They did. <laughs> And, 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 they, and they fought for their right to party. And uh, it was, uh, <laughs> yeah, and it, it worked, it worked. It's really grassroots effort is what you're saying. Absolutely, absolutely. You gotta fight for your right to party. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm curious about uh, if we could elaborate a little bit further on CBDCs and kind of the mutually exclusive nature and idealism behind having a U.S. government-backed, surveilled electronic currency, while we already have these decentralized currencies that are not surveilled uh, and may give more civil liberties to their holders and aren't maybe subject to the whims of the current administration. What was the question? So the question is just to, if you can elaborate further on CBDCs and the surveillance and the administrative uh, effect on them and potentially maybe where we could see uh, decentralized currencies that aren't prone to these centralized failures grow. So you just put yourself in the shoes of, um, of the people of Earth. Uh, the last 50 years have seen the greatest increase in prosperity, of human prosperity in history, in global history. Uh, in 1981, the Human starvation rate was uh, over 50%. Uh, now it's under four. It might creep up next year, but it's been really low. The human murder rate's lowest ever been. Every year, we become more and more prosperous. Poverty keeps getting eliminated. People are living longer, living healthier. Slavery is illegal in every country in the world now. On and on. There's non-combatants. There's a there's a huge wealth explosion, and that is because of the post World War II. U.S. dollar domination. So <laughs> put yourself in their shoes, right? The managers of this global economic system that keeps expanding wealth. And now there's an interloper, uh, a, a, an oncoming freight train of a currency you cannot control, right? And what does it do to that system? It's unknown. So I think if you're, if you're tasked with maintaining um, the prosperity of, of, your, of your country um, and other countries, you're going to get a hold of it. And you're going to create your own version of it because it's inevitable. You know, it's an innovation. Once you have a light, once you have electric light, you're not going to go back to, to candles. <laughs> right? <laughs> and so they see it too. Everyone's pushing for instant settlement. Why am I sending you an ACH and you're not getting here for 11 days? Yeah. But you can... <laughs> But if but if I'm one second late getting a deposit to cover in uh, cover a bill or something, I'm getting I'm getting thing thirty five dollars right. Everyone knows that's unfair and it's BS, right? So the dem the democratic push for efficiency in money is undeniable. So they they're responding, right? But I do think that it is in they're they're motivated to to make sure that it stays in control of the government. And our, our rival countries are, they don't even hide it, right? They are, they outlaw anything not owned by the state, right? Mm -hmm. So the role for decentralized currencies, what do they play? I think, um, I think they're, they will, their issue, honestly, is that until there's adoption on the retail level of cryptocurrencies, they always have to get translated into, into fiat currency. And that's where they stop you. Right. Add fees. So you can, if you can, if you can try living one month on your favorite um, coin. Like just don't spend anything but your favorite coin for 30 days, and then DM me. Let me know what that was like. <laughs> <laughs> right? So that's the issue, right? You just you can't live on it yet, but maybe in the future you will be too. And then 
we'll see what happens. I mean, this could be the, this could be um, a de-evolution of global order. In a positive way? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that's the problem, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, I think we have time for one more, one more question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hi there. Thank you uh, so much for the for the talk. I, uh, I'm really interested in the convergence on the traditional and the decentralized side, especially as it relates to the affordable housing projects that you were speaking about and the municipal bonds as well. I, can you speak to how that plays out with like actual deals. I don't imagine that there's going to be enough funding for large projects, you know, especially as you go across the bay, just for the decentralized funding source. So what, how does that play out as well with the legal exchange, especially here in these early stages when, when it's being implemented? Thanks. Again, uh, what, what's the question exactly? Do you convert, how does this play out with the convergence when you actually are trying to execute a deal where you, these two parties, traditional and decentralized, are coming together to actually mm -hmm. get multi-million dollar you know, deals done, especially infrastructure, affordable housing, and such? Right, well, I, I, think, I think as soon as, as soon as it's demonstrated to work once in that context, the crowdfunded context, because it's been done now repeatedly, more than a dozen times, but in large amounts and with large entities, right? That's happened in France and Spain, China, um, uh, a couple of UN agencies, Australia. Um, but in this context, uh, it hasn't been shown to work because it's never been done. But I think when, when, the, when the use case is, is, is shown, uh, it'll rapidly be deployed because, I mean, people everywhere want some kind of yield-bearing instrument and they just don't have access to it now. And so if you could really get, expand that, you could. If, it's, if, 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 if the technology becomes easy to uptake, where you can just get an email and sign up for it and pay your 25 bucks and get something that pays you for 30 years, whatever, uh, that's something that can happen in a big way. So I, I think the, the, there is no limitation uh, on, the, on the investor base because these, are, these can be credit investors, right? If it's a private, activity, they have to be accredited, and that's a very small base. Mm -hmm. um, so that's different. So I think it remains to be seen. I think that is, depending on what happens with uh, the large infrastructure bill that got, that got passed, the Inflation Reduction Act, which is a massive, massive public works uh, renewable energy infrastructure program, uh, I think that that's built with so many layers of bonding to other funding sources, et cetera. I think it'll be interesting to see what what creative people come up with to merge with those funding streams. Absolutely. And I do think I want to let folks know that keep an eye on this Berkeley micro bond that Ben spearheaded because I think um, it really could be a way for us to tie financial inclusion um, and raising money for cities uh, together. So I think that's a really exciting thing. Um, well, any last thoughts? I have, uh, we've, I wanted to ask you one more question which is, what is your advice, this is a question I like to ask, to law students and lawyers looking to break into this space? Yeah, so uh, <laughs> learn securities rules, I guess, a big <laughs> one. But, <laughs> but I, you know, so for law students, of course, just, you know, read up on the stuff. Lawyers, too, just, read, just become familiar with it. And it, it seems very arcane and very, um, I guess, hard to understand. But if you take the the... 5,000 foot view, is that, does he, the 30,000 foot view, is that what they say? If you take the, that very high view, uh, you'll see it's the same stuff that's in every other business. You have contracts, you have people over here, and this is a different set of circumstances because you're dealing with illegal securities all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so you end up, go, you have to know where to go overseas to do things. Um, and those are just, those are specialized knowledge you get from reading, you know? So it, I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be too daunted by it. It's a fun field. It's the best client base you can ever have because they're fun, rebellious people um, who want to save the world, most of them, mm -hmm. right? So it's a, they're inspirational to work with. Um, yeah, just don't be, don't be afraid. Just read up on it and just jump into it. Well, that is pretty great advice to close out our conference. Um, and thank you so much, Ben, for taking the time to be here with us and for your support of the center. Um, and I can't wait to see what you do next. We're going to be staying in touch with Ben, so uh, we really appreciate your time. Thank you. Such Thank a pleasure. You.